The title of my message this morning is simply this, Beyond Sincere Doubts. Jesus told a paralyzed man his sins were forgiven. And the scribes accused him of blasphemy. Jesus showed mercy to tax collectors, and the Pharisees rejected him for it. Now, another group comes to Jesus, but they don't reject Jesus. They don't accuse Jesus. They ask an honest question, which he answers. In between those people who reject Jesus and those people who believe and follow Jesus, there are very often people who have questions. There are people who have doubts. Maybe you're one of them. You don't know what to make of this man called the Christ. When we look at this passage in Matthew 9, I see Jesus take the time to answer the question of some, some, some sincere but misguided disciples. He takes the time. He answers them, and I love him for it. I love him for it. Bring your doubts. Bring your confusion. Just don't stay away. Come and learn from Jesus. But, but who are these men who come and ask Jesus this question, this question that sits at the heart of this whole encounter, this passage that we just read? They're, they are disciples of John the Baptist. We're told that in verse 14. And John the Baptist was the final of the prophets God had sent to prepare the people for the coming of Christ. For the first advent, John the Baptist was the final of those prophets. And, and Matthew, the writer of this gospel, describes John's ministry, you may remember, in Matthew chapter 3, especially his preaching. Jesus came to John one day, and it's recorded in Matthew 3, Jesus came to John to be baptized, and John thought it should be the other way around. John said, basically, you come to me, I should be baptized by you. But Jesus insisted. John, he saw things rightly. He was not a misguided prophet. He, he saw that he wasn't even fit to untie Jesus' sandals. And John he wasn't any slouch either. John was a holy man. He was a, a man of God. He lived in the wilderness. He dressed like he lived in the wilderness. He ate stuff he found in the wilderness. He was a, a disciplined man. He lived a harsh life in devotion to God. He was a holy man. But he saw rightly that he was not fit to tie or untie the sandals that Jesus wore. There's a big gap between the holiest of men and the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. This group who comes to Jesus with this question in chapter 9, verse 14, they're John's disciples, his students. You, you see, the last time Matthew mentioned John, you may recall, it was in chapter 4, verse 12. Matthew mentions that Jesus had heard that John the Baptist had been arrested. And from that point, Jesus moved into Capernaum 
and began his ministry there in Galilee. Now that's, that's important to understand as we come to this passage. It's important to understand because Jesus and John are on the same side. Or rather, John is on Jesus' side. We should say it that way. They're actually cousins, if you remember, in the Gospel of Luke. And these disciples of John's, they don't oppose Jesus. They're confused. So what we read here that Matthew gives us, it was a teaching opportunity. What Jesus said in this passage, what is recorded that our Lord said, was for those disciples of John. He was teaching them. But what Matthew wrote about what Jesus said, what Matthew wrote is for Matthew's readers, right? For, for you and for me who read this. It's for those who read and hear this gospel, which includes us today. This account is included in every one of the synoptic gospels, the parallel gospels, Matthew and Mark and Luke. It's included in every one of them, this encounter with Jesus and this group that asks this question. But only in the gospel of Matthew does Matthew, only Matthew mentions specifically that these are John's disciples who ask this question. Only Matthew gives us that detail. What does that do? Well, it makes us see them as real people a little, doesn't it? It kind of humanizes the people asking this question. It might even, and I think it's intended, it might even give us a little bit of sympathy towards them. Especially knowing that their reader, as we do from chapter 4, that their leader, their, their mentor, their teacher, their master is in prison and they are troubled by what they are seeing as they come to Jesus. This is not about religion versus Jesus Christ. This is about Jesus showing misguided disciples what they're missing. And it's wonderful. So, what does Matthew aim for you to take away from all this today? We're going to see that how he writes this and, and where he places this encounter, just in chapter 9 even, it communicates a message. We're going to see that Matthew is communicating a call. He seems to urge his readers to go beyond the doubts that John's disciples had. And what he writes in this gospel, it here in, encourages three kinds of response from you today. The first response comes out of verse 14. Why, why don't you look there with me? The first response is this. Respond to your sin with sorrow. Verse 14 says this. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we <clears throat> and the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. Why indeed? Well, the first thing to notice in verse 14 here is that the question they ask Jesus, it isn't hostile. It's a question. It seems genuine. And Jesus responds to them in kind. He doesn't respond to them with a rebuke, like he certainly said to the Pharisees. Jesus doesn't challenge them back. Jesus doesn't condemn them for fasting. He doesn't call them hypocrites like he did the Pharisees about their fasting back in chapter 6. Jesus points out what they're missing. That's what he does. He points out what they're missing. He even adds at the end of verse 15 <clears throat> that there <clears throat> will be a time for fasting later. There'll be a time for fasting later. But the right kind of fasting we need to understand. For these disciples of John, their kind of fasting is the right kind of fasting. It's a response that Jesus approves of. In verse 14, we read this. The disciples of John came to him ask, and saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? 
let's not forget that Jesus himself fasted. Do you remember? One time for 40 days. That was a fast. Jesus obviously approves of fasting. This was right after John the Baptist baptized Jesus. <clears throat> when fasting is for the right reasons, Jesus obviously approves. But look at what they asked Jesus. <clears throat> Excuse me. They fast. The Pharisees fast. The disciples of the Pharisees fast. But Jesus' disciples have just been enjoying a feast at Matthew's house. And so why, why did John teach his disciples to fast? What is it behind their question? We'll look back at John's teaching in Matthew chapter 3. And you'll get the idea. Turn there with me to Matthew chapter 3. Look at verses 1 through 6. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. That gives you an idea why John's disciples were taught to fast. For repentance, as a sign of confessing their sin, of, of turning to God from their sin, of seeking God, seeking his mercy. That was the theme of John's whole ministry that we know about. So these disciples appear to be genuine. They appear to be humble. They appear to be students of their master. But they say, we fast. The disciples of the Pharisees fast. Well, the Pharisees are a different story. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus called those guys hypocrites. For fasting, not because of God, but to be seen by people. You remember? Fasting as a performance for an audience, as a religious thing that made them look great or holy or something like that. Jesus didn't hold back his words when he responded to their fasting. He called them hypocrites. Their fasting was not for God at all. That's in Matthew 6, verse 16. So now contrast that. Contrast that hypocrisy with this here, this encounter with Jesus and these disciples of John. Does Jesus rebuke John's disciples for fasting? No. Does he call them hypocrites for fasting? No. Not at all. Because their fasting is a sign of genuine repentance from sin. And it was an appropriate response to what John the Baptist had been preaching and teaching. Appropriate. Why appropriate? Well, Matthew said John's ministry was a fulfillment of that prophecy in Isaiah 40, verse 3. The prophecy said, prepare the way of, and here we go to the Legacy Standard Bible because it now translates the, the word Lord as Yahweh, which is a right translation. So the Legacy Standard Bible says in Isaiah 43, 40, verse 3, prepare the way of Yahweh. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That was John's whole goal. To make people ready to meet Yahweh. So he called the people of Israel to repentance. To confess their sins. To turn from sin and turn to God. In baptism... Apparently, in fasting, as he had apparently had taught his disciples, confessing and turning. This is all good. It is a gracious thing. A gracious gift from God. When he lets you see your sin for what it is. Isn't it gracious? When God lets you see what your sin represents, 
when He lets you see the sinfulness of your sin. There are actions and there are attitudes that don't seem to you like a big deal. You're quick to make excuses for them. But then something changes. And you see them, these things you used to accept in your life. And you see them and you hate them. And you, you see them as hate crimes against a holy, loving, and patient God. You see them as a personal offense and a spitting upon the name of your heavenly Father. The things that you used to think were no big deal in your life. It is a gracious thing when God lets you begin to see your sin. And if you come to see what disciples of John the Baptist apparently understood, how acutely you need God's mercy, you would fast too. You would fast more. You would pray. You would cast yourself down on your face in humble repentance before him with all your heart until, like we sang in that song, until you find the grace that satisfies. Until you find the grace you need. It is a gracious thing from God when he lets you see your sin so that you discover your need for Jesus. If there was one thing John's disciples had learned, it was that the sins of their people ran deep. But they also saw that the people's repentance, the nation's repentance was too shallow. They knew Israel needed the salvation God's word had promised for a long time. They knew it. They needed it. the Savior that John preached was coming. They knew it. They needed God, and, and so they believed it was a time for fasting. So in their sorrow, they bring their question to Jesus. And it reminds me, just in this encounter, of what Jesus said in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You know, when I was a kid, every Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, December 26th, we used to have an annual family reunion. We rent, it was a big family. There'd be a couple hundred of us probably, and we'd rent this camp, this uh, horse ranch out in Maple Ridge, and we'd all gather there on Boxing Day. One time, and we'd play games, all the cousins, and there are a lot of cousins, you know, I don't know, 40, 50 cousins or something, and we'd sit around tables and play big board games together. I loved that, those days. And one time, I remember we were setting up Monopoly. Who doesn't like Monopoly? We were setting up, uh, uh, there will be, be a time for repentance later. And we were setting up a Monopoly, and we asked one of my uncles who was walking by, I won't say which uncle, we asked him, would you like to join us in Monopoly? And he looked at us, and I don't remember exactly his words, but the point of it was this. Jesus is coming back soon. This is no time for games. John's disciples remind me of my uncle. Their hearts are in the right place, obviously. But they don't know what they're missing. For us, it was just monopoly. For them, it was so much more. Next, Matthew tells us how Jesus calls them to something more. The second response I see Matthew encouraging from us in this text is respond to your bridegroom with joy. You know, repenting from sin is absolutely necessary. You cannot be a Christian without it. But it's not an end in itself. It's a step towards something more. So John's disciples ask their question, and Jesus answers them, of course, with a question. Look with me at verse 15. And Jesus said to them, Can... Is it possible? Can the wedding guests mourn 
as long as the bridegroom is with them? Good question. But what's he talking about? They asked about fasting. It's like they see themselves, John's disciples, they see themselves at Israel's funeral because God is coming. And Jesus describes it as a wedding because God is coming. Well, because God has come. But look at verse 15. Jesus pictures it, you see it there? As his own wedding day. Or days. Because we're talking about a Jewish wedding custom here. The feast would go on, the party would go on for days. I mean, what do you say when your best friend phones you up and blurts, I'm getting married! What do you say? You'd better come over. I am so sorry this is happening to you. Tell you what, we'll fast. We'll fast and we'll pray for mercy. Is that what you say when your friend blurts out, I'm getting married? No, of course not. If you do, you're a bad friend. What do you say? You say, Congratulations! I'm so happy for you. You don't deserve her, but I'm happy for you. You see, that's wonderful. You share the joy, right? Of course. Well, the picture Jesus has in mind is a wedding. It's his wedding. It's a Jewish wedding. The translation there in verse 15, the wedding guests, you see those words? In the original language, it, it's so culturally laden that we need an interpretation, not just a translation. Because in the original, it's sons of the bridal chamber. It doesn't even make sense anymore. But it did for them. Matthew here is talking about, Jesus is talking about the attendants of the bridegroom. It's like the, the groomsmen. Yes, they're guests, but they're special guests of the groom. They're his friends. And Jesus is saying they're happy because he's getting married. They're his best men and the groomsmen and so on. And they're overjoyed because of what's happening. That's why Jesus' question is about what his disciples can do. What they're able to do. That's what it says. Are the attendants of the groom even able to mourn on such a day as this? What's the answer? It's a rhetorical question, isn't it? The answer is, of course, no, you can't. Not if you love this groom. Not if you love this man. Not if you understand what's happening here. How could you mourn on such a day as this? It would be inappropriate to mourn on such a day as this. But you see, there's something else here. There's more going on here, Jesus shows. Jesus is talking to John's disciples, and John had told them, Jesus is the bridegroom. Let me say that again. John the Baptist had told his disciples, these guys, that Jesus is the bridegroom. Sometime earlier, again, John's disciples, they come to John with a question because they're seeing something else that's bothering them. You know what they were seeing? It's in John chapter 3, verse 28 and 30. They were seeing all the people Instead of following their master, we're going over and following Jesus. And it bothered them. And they brought it to John's intention. And you know what John said? To those same disciples of his, he said, I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. And therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. John called Jesus the bridegroom. To those same disciples of his, John had said that the people following Jesus, coming to Jesus, being saved by Jesus, putting their faith in Jesus, it's the bride. Jesus was gathering a bride. And it made John's joy complete, he said. It made him happy to see it. So he must decrease. And Jesus must increase. 
Not a time for fasting, but for feasting. But it was more than a metaphor when John described Jesus like that, wasn't it? More than a metaphor. It was a prophecy. One place that the bridegroom prophecy is found is Isaiah 62. It says, the prophet Isaiah says to Zion, As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Isaiah 62 verse 5. Did you hear that? So shall your God rejoice over you, his bride. I don't know if John the Baptist, if he really understood what that implied about Jesus. But he he was a prophet. I am certain, though, that Jesus understood what that was saying. They might not have known who Jesus is, but Jesus knew who Jesus is. They might have still been waiting for Yahweh to visit Israel like John had promised, like John had preached. But in the person of Jesus Christ, he had arrived. He was there. It was not the time for sorrow but joy. It was not the time to plead for mercy, but to thank God for grace. To receive it. It was not the time to pray for grace, but to accept that grace in the one God had sent. Isn't that right? So Jesus asks, can the attendants of the bridegroom mourn? Is it possible for them to mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Well, only if they don't know they're at a wedding. And if they don't know the bridegroom, and if they don't know that they're not just on the guest list, they're part of the bride. But when Jesus gives the first hint of what's coming I wonder if his disciples were listening. Israel's bridegroom had come. But Israel wasn't pure. Israel's sin guilt still hung over her head, didn't it? She was still in her sins. Before the bridegroom could have his wedding, he had to save his bride. Before he could marry her, he would have to die for her. So look what Jesus foreshadows there in the middle of verse 15. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. John had been taken away from his disciples. They must have thought of that when Jesus said this. But Jesus here hints for the first time in the Gospel of Matthew. For the very first time that he was on a mission and his work had only just begun. He said, didn't he, that he'd be back on the third day? That he would die, be killed, and rise again on the third day? Their time for fasting, though, wasn't while he lay in the tomb dead. Because he was going to be leaving again, wasn't he? Adam just taught us about that. When our Lord ascended, he sent his Holy Spirit. He didn't leave us alone, but he did leave. And now is the time for fasting. See, the bridegroom had come. The celebration had begun. But the ceremony would be postponed for a little while. We're still waiting for that wedding day, aren't we? When the Lord claims his bride from Israel. Even now as he's gathering people from all over the nations to be part of his people, to be in his kingdom, the metaphors pile up and spill over each other. The Lord is collecting one soul at a time for almost 2,000 years, a bride, a bride Saving her one soul at a time. What a picture. But he's also gathering the people for his kingdom. And he's not nearly finished yet. Even if we are living in the end times, there's still Israel to be saved. 
praise God, he's not forgotten his wedding. He's not forgotten his bride. He's getting her ready even now. Listen, you need, as a Christian, you need both of these rhythms in your life. You need to re repent with sorrow for your sin, and you need to rejoice in who your bridegroom is. You need both of these rhythms all the time in your life. Now is the time to fast. Because if your repentance is shallow, did you know that your joy will be meager? And if your delight in Jesus Christ is anemic, weak, sickly, then your repentance and your longing for righteousness in your life will be a fickle thing, a skinny thing, a shadow of what it should be. You need both of these rhythms, sorrow for your sin and joy in Jesus Christ, and you need them every day, every day. Otherwise, if you don't, you'll be stuck in your Christian life. You'll, you'll be a stunted little thing of a Christian. You'll stagnate. So, Matthew here writes this, so that you respond to your sin with sorrow, and so that you respond to your bridegroom with joy, but there's more. There's more going on here. Thirdly, you need to respond to Jesus' gospel with faith. When John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus began his ministry in Galilee. And, and what, was, what was Jesus' message? What, what did he preach? Our Lord, what did he preach? It says in Matthew 4.23, at the beginning of that ministry, he went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. And look at the end of chapter 9, the chapter we're in today. Look at the end of chapter 9. In Matthew 9, verse 35, what does it say? Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages. I have a pulpit to pound. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Those two verses show us what Jesus preached from the beginning of his ministry all the way to the end of chapter 9. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom everywhere he went. Jesus wanted people to hear his good news, his gospel. And Matthew wrote this down so you could hear it too. And respond. And respond with the faith that he next shows us in chapter 9. If you look at verse 18, respond with the faith of the ruler in verse 18. That's why that comes next after this passage. Respond with the faith of the suffering woman in verse 22. Respond with the faith of the blind men in verse 28. Even the blind men in verse 28. Respond with faith to the gospel message Jesus is preaching here. So Matthew puts this question from John's troubled disciples right before all these responses of faith. Do you see it? Do you see what Matthew's driving at? What is your response to the gospel of Jesus? How do you respond? Like the scribes and Pharisees at the beginning of chapter 9? Who rejected Jesus? Or like those who put their faith in him in the rest of chapter 9? Between those kind of responses, between those extremes, there are people who come to Jesus with doubts, with sincere, genuine questions. Don't stay where they are. Can the wedding guests mourn when the bridegroom's still with them? No. Obviously, they can't. Obviously, John's disciples were not ready for the kingdom that Jesus was preaching. That's obvious, but Jesus now illustrates it for them with two 
examples drawn from ordinary life. Look what Jesus says here in verse 16. It's about how a new piece of cloth and an old piece of cloth are not compatible. Yet. Not compatible yet. It's about what has to happen to that new cloth to make it ready, to make it compatible. Look at verse 16 with me. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment and a worse tear is made. See where it says unshrunk cloth? You see those words, unshrunk cloth? This is another one of those cultural words that even when it's translated, we don't know what it means anymore. We've lost this vocabulary in English. It it literally says unfold cloth. Unfold, like a fuller folds cloth. See, that's that's what I meant. We don't even use that language anymore. A fuller is an ancient equivalent of a dry cleaner. They didn't have dry cleaning back then. But people would weave cloth and typically wool or I don't know what else, but they'd bring it and it would be uh, loose, a loose weave. Just the way, the way you could make it with a, a loom and whatever else they use, I don't know, I know nothing about this, but they, it, there'd be big gaps in the, in the fibers and in the weaving. And the fuller's job, they'd bring it to the fuller and the fuller would take this material and steep it, immerse it in water mixed with chemicals. Chemicals that would do its work on that material. Chemicals like ammonia, which they often got from urine. And so this was a very smelly business. And, and it, they'd immerse this cloth in this mixture. And then they'd, they'd take it out, and the fuller would, would then beat it or scrape it, depending on the nature of the cloth, to get all the natural oils and the gum out of the fibers, and so there's just the pure fiber left. And, and the, they would na- bleach it and, and dry it and press it with the fuller's press until the, the material begins to tighten up together into a tight weave. Until it shrank and it was fit for clothing. Nobody would skip that process ever. Nobody would patch clothes with unfold cloth. As the unfold cloth drank, d- dried out and shrunk, it would tear away. It would pull away from the, the clothing that had already been fold. So what Jesus is saying is that cloth, that patch, had to be prepared. It had to be treated. It had to be changed if it was going to be good for anything. And what Jesus is saying here, the point he's making gets a bit clearer with the next illustration. Look at verse 17. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But the new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. Wine was fermented. Don't ever listen to those preachers who tell you, no, it it wasn't. It was just grape juice back then. It was fermented. That's the whole point of this illustration. It was fermented first in large vats, big vats. But then you'd strain it, and you'd pour the strained wine into leather bags used as bottles. Our translation calls them wineskins. But it had to be new leather, supple leather, Soft and pliable leather, because as the wine ferments, the chemical process makes it expand. The pressure builds, and so the leather had to be able to expand with it. Otherwise, if it was old, dried out, crusty old leather, it would break when the wine is continuing to ferment. And it would burst, and you'd lose the wine and ruin the wineskin, and who wants to do that? Again, the... The point is that a process has to take place. A change is happening to the wine. And in this example, the process of change is a process that everybody could relate to. So you have a patch of new cloth that has to be changed, and you've got new wine that goes through a process of change. 
And what Jesus was teaching John's disciples is that repenting from sin is not enough. They need to change. One time, years after this, when the Apostle Paul was in the city of Ephesus, which is a long way from here, he met some disciples who had been apparently baptized by John or by John's disciples, and he asked them if if they had received the Holy Spirit when they were baptized. And they responded, they didn't even know who the Spirit was. Who is the Holy Spirit? They hadn't heard of him. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is, Jesus. And on hearing this, Luke tells us in Acts chapter 19, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's not enough to just be sorry for your sins. It's not enough to just be happy to learn about Jesus. You need to be changed. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Adam, for your teaching this morning. One more example. I mentioned that Matthew and Mark and Luke all include this question about fasting in their Gospels. But only Matthew specifically tells us who these people are. Well, you know, the only gospel that doesn't mention this question about fasting is the gospel of John. But John's gospel includes the story of Nicodemus. Thank you, Adam. The Pharisee, Nicodemus, comes to Jesus and says, he can tell that Jesus is from God. An astute man. And you know what Jesus says? No one can see the kingdom of heaven unless he is born again. Born again. Nicodemus is confused. He doesn't understand what what being born again means. So Jesus explains that in order to enter the kingdom of God, you need to be reborn by the Holy Spirit. New birth. Regenerated. Jesus here only hints at these truths, but he hints at these truths. He only hints at this at this point in time on that day when John's disciples asked this question about fasting. But what he hints takes on massive importance later on as more is understood. He hinted, for example, that he was going to be taken away from his disciples, right? from the attendance at the wedding. Later, he was arrested, and he was tried, and he was killed. And then, on the third day, he rose and was with his disciples for a while longer, but then he ascended into glory, into heaven, and departed once again. He hinted at that here. He hinted also that something has to happen to those disciples of John as he was teaching them. Something has to change before they'll be ready for what Jesus had come to do. And later, Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to give new life to all who believe in him. Do you realize Jesus ransomed you from your sin by dying for you? Do you realize the bridegroom Bled for you, his bride. Well, if you know this, have you surrendered your life to Christ? Have you given him yourself and everything you have? With this question from John's disciples, Matthew has now shown us how three religious groups come to Jesus, how they respond to Jesus. The first two, the scribes and the Pharisees, in chapter 9, they rejected Jesus. This third group is, they're sincere, but they're misguided. They don't know the whole story. They don't know the whole gospel. And the next two events in Matthew 9 are about people who believe, who put their faith in Jesus Christ. We'll look at those in coming weeks. And that's what you need to do. 
not just repent of your sins, believe, trust, put your faith in Jesus Christ, be born again, be changed. I love that old story about George Whitfield where he was often preaching about the need to be born again and a, a woman came to him, a stuffy old lady, and she said to him, Mr. Whitfield, why are you always telling people you must be born again? And he said, Madam, it's because you must be born again. You must. You must be made new. In John 3, verse 7, Jesus says very plainly, do not marvel at this, that I say to you, you must be born again. Let me suggest to you as I close one final implication of these verses from verse 15. Look at verse 15. And see the implication of hope here. Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom, the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. And then they will fast. Fast for what? Jesus is the bridegroom. And the people he died to save are his bride. And he was taken away from the wedding guest for a little while. And we need him. And so we fast in our need for him until we experience and we receive the grace that we need to survive, to sustain us, to get us through the day, to get us through the hardship. But you see, Jesus left his bride at his wedding day and he went away and he's coming back again. That's what this implies. It's not explicit, but it's there. If he left, he's coming back. If he is the bridegroom, he's coming back as the bridegroom. There is a wedding day to look forward to and Revelation 19 looks forward to that day with these words. Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Can you imagine that day? And his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself with fine linen, pure, fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to John, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's pray. Father, we ask that as we recognize, Lord, the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ in this text of Scripture, we ask that as we submit to his lordship, as we bow to his authority, that you would not only continue to convict us of our sin, you would show us our need for the Savior you have provided. We would rejoice because of your great grace to us, your great mercy. We would rejoice in Jesus Christ our Lord as we believe in the gospel that he proclaimed. That, Lord, you would take these converted lives of, lives of ours as your Holy Spirit indwells us. That you would take these changed people in this church. That you would take us and you would continue to adorn us, to, to clothe us with fine linen, bright and pure, which is the righteous deeds of the saints. That you would make us, Lord, a bride who is not just happy to be won by you, happy to be your bride but you would make us a bride, Lord, who is beautiful to you. Oh, Lord, complete your work in us, we pray, until the day of our Lord, until the day Jesus comes. Complete your work in us, we ask in his name. Amen.